see the presentation slides. Yes. Okay. So, Bob, it's that time of the year. It's March, right before April Fool season about to start. And we know we could have been in our pool swimming if we had a collector. So, you know, let's take a look at what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, and sorry, I'm having an issue with our presentation here. I'm trying to. Is it, okay, there we go. Uh, so we're going to talk about pool heating, solar thermal pool heating today. Right. All the benefit that it brings, all the. Uh, basically extra benefit that you will get out of uh, the investment that you already made with you know building your pool either whether residential or commercial either one we know it costs a good chunk of money to create a good size pool and uh, if you just extend the amount of time that you're using that pool by nature you are getting more out of your investment so we're going to go over that today we're going to talk about how of uh, solar thermal uh, would basically play into that. How can solar thermal really uh, help with heating your pool and how all that works? I'm going to go over uh, the different types that are using, how to size the system. We're going to talk about that a little bit. We're going to get into the benefits. We're going to mention some of the financial incentives that we know about, and uh, we have some case studies and a quick um just uh, get an idea of a ROI for a system we have some examples of that then Bob here will answer any questions that you might have so uh, why don't you explain about the different the, 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 you know we have two type of polls right if you want to really you know broadly categorize them you know residential and commercial polls right right residential generally or outdoor single family residents um, they're used uh, basically during the swim season which varies throughout the country in california it's may through october maybe a little less in the northeast um, the commercial pools are both indoor and outdoor uh, they're sometimes used uh, 12 months out of the year. So they're heated 12 months out of the year, especially if it's a gym or a swim center or a school that you that has swim teams and soccer, they heat the pool. So there's a constant um, demand for natural gas generally to heat it. Um, some pools, um, the commercial pools can be heated with, as you can see on the left, um, in cooler climates with our uh, boxed and glazed collectors for uh, added heat when it's cooler outside. Oh, Bob, um, just a quick question. I remember we were having a conversation about indoor pool heating and you were explaining to me the chemicals that are used in indoor pools and how they're different and, and the need for heating it, even if they're not being used, you know, the maintenance of the certain temperature is necessary for the indoor pool, right? Well, an indoor pool is going usually is going to be used, so yeah. it's usually maintained at a certain temperature. They don't unless it's vacant for a while. They'll they'll maintain that temperature. And, and again, in order to do that, um, they'll use various various amounts of natural gas depending on its use. The more use in a in any pool, the more uh, evaporation you get, which is the number one uh, method for heat loss, and therefore you have to replace the heat that's lost. So a uh, pool that's just static, as you can see in the center picture, may not need as much heat as when they start swimming in that pool or have a, a swim meet. 
it's churning up the water and the heat's dissipating so the heater comes on and no one ever knows but except the gas bill <laughs> um, swimming pools are a major home investment make the night the yard look great um, they provide a lot of uh, recreation uh, providing you can use it um, if it's cold most people won't get into a pool period uh, if it's a little warm they might spend 10 minutes in the pool and leave but if you have a nice warm pool you can spend the whole afternoon and into the evening enjoy uh, your uh, family or friends over and it just makes for a great experience and the way to do that is uh, with a, a solar thermal pool heating system uh, yeah one thing that i especially it was a personal experience where um, staying at a place um, for a longer period of time, you know, I, it had a pool heater, but uh, you know, we had to turn it on uh, whenever it was on demand. And because I, I understand that the owner of the property was trying to conserve energy, so it wasn't on all the time because right. that's in a huge race. But every time we wanted to go in the pool, somebody had to remember at least three, four hours ahead of time, if you know, we we're lucky as uh, you know, turn it on so we could get in the pool. Right. But if you have the solar thermal. A pool heating system that is continuously maintaining the temperature right. of your pool at that desired temperature. It means you can jump in the pool pretty much, you right. know, at any point of the day without having to, you know, go ahead of time and turn right. anything on. Yeah. So Rent, rentals are that way. I we've we've done long ago, at least myself, done yeah. uh, jobs for rentals and the the solar addition made it very nice for the home for for the for the tent for the people using the home and for the owner because they didn't have to worry about the heater running and that expense they just turn it on once uh, the solar usually takes in the beginning about a week to heat the pool from startup when you, ha you have to have a week of good weather then it stays generally at the temperature you set it to for the swim season right. so you don't have to turn the gas on unless you you know have a spa that's where the heater comes into play. Right. Um, well, you know, Jim, again, I know in design and nature, they differ a little, um, actually a, a lot, you know, commercial pools and residential pools, but could you just go over some of the main issues that you have to take into consideration when you're approaching a pool project? Uh, you know, as a former contractor and as a uh, current uh, uh, Sonar Encyclopedia Center. <laughs> well, how would you approach a pool, pool, like a pool project, when you are, you know, looking at it? What are the things that you take into account? What are the things that you go over and make sure, you know, you're already accounting for, basically? Well, you're looking at the physical uh, area of the pool um, and the depth. So, average pools are about five feet deep. A lot of them are shallow now, so they're maybe three and a half or four feet. But generally. Uh, all the sizings based on the old standards of a three to eight foot pool. You take the area of the pool, so the length times the width. Uh, the length of the swimming season that the, in your area or what the people uh, would like to see. The temperatures of the local area, the desired pool temperatures at, and at what time of year. That's very important, especially if you're dealing in areas where the season may be flipped, i.e. the uh, rec um, resort areas that people come to in the winter and they they're come to let's say Palm Springs or uh, the desert and they want a hot pool so that you have to consider that consider that the site location you can see in this picture that's pretty nice the panels are facing south it's sheltered uh, you might have an area where you have a lot of wind um, and the coastal areas you have to consider uh, collector efficiency um, is you want to make sure you have a, a high efficiency panel so you can collect the maximum amount of solar during the uh, daytime hours. A pool cover may be um, an, uh, a requirement for your desired needs if you have um, breezes or you want to maintain that temperature through uh, the night or through some cloudy weather. It also helps with evaporation. A building codes um, usually are, are amenable to, to solar pool covenants with homeowners associations. You just, you know, most of those uh, 
have been dealt with, especially with solar the way it, uh, going the way it is. You just follow their what they want, though. Don't don't try to go around any homeowners association requirements. Um, you know, size it, size the solar to match the customer's needs um, within the swim, usually within a swim season for that area. So that's what we look for mm -hmm. on the on the on the front end. Uh, one of uh, you know one of the things that uh, we touched on uh, was the you know what are the building codes and covenants and what's going on you know uh, and I'm noticing that there are some jurisdictions you know in different parts that it, they either require or highly encourage use of solar pool heating for your pool heating applications uh, which is you know it's a great incentive but once uh, you know, you look at it from uh, the perspective of comfort that, um, you know, this brings to your pool and how much more you can use it. It's just a big question that why is it not, you know, more encouraged by uh, different, you know, well, players in the game, you know. So I mean, the, the choice is you either have a warm pool or you don't. And yeah. If you want a warm pool with gas, you pay for it or with a heat pump, you're going to pay for that fossil fuel. So. It's your choice. That's why they, they don't. Uh, there's no requirement for building departments or anyone else. Usually, that you have a solar heater specifically. Um, but if you're going to heat the pool, there may be some, um, you know, local jurisdictions well, that want you to have solar. I uh, yeah. I mean, off the top of my head, I know your favorite jurisdiction, City of Santa Monica, requires solar pool heating for a pool heater, correct? Uh, they may, they yeah. May. Yeah, it, right. if, yeah, there's always with jurisdictions and regulations, there's always, um, you know, caveats that come into play, meaning if there's no, you know, you just have to deal with the jurisdiction up front and with the specific job, you know, every job's different. So these are like right. custom, custom jobs. And also what's happening with pools is the building, Building codes, uh, more and more cities are requiring uh, building permits for solar pool heating. So you want to make sure the manufacturer's um, ma um, installation manuals are, are kind of up to date and you have a copy of that for the building department because that's usually all they look for. Although I've heard recently that some require, can require um, uh, structural engineering for the pool panels, which yeah, that, that maybe has to be dealt with further on with the jurisdictions, but the, the, the weight that you're putting on the roof is negligible compared to you know, the area. It's no, not necessary, but jurisdictions have their. Yeah, I, exactly. I mean, uh, just a quick segue to our next month's webinar. We're going to get into the building codes and all the fun stuff that uh, revolves around jurisdictions and different requirements and different covenants that might be in place. So uh, if you want to know more about how that plays out for us and our experiences with different codes and whatnot, definitely tune in for the next one. But uh, circling back to our main topic, the fun topic of solar pool heating yeah. again, having swim in a warm pool. Uh, can you? Uh, Mention some of the common mistakes that you've seen with the design of a solar pool heating, you know, from the, all the systems that you've seen, all the calls that you get, you know, hey, I have this on my house, but my pool is not hot. You know, what are the mistakes? What are the, um, you know, either in the design or in the operation of the system? What's, you know, what are the common things that you see? Well, I'll do it. I'll do an extreme. Uh, one extreme is that the location of the pool was in an, an in an area that had a constant, almost constant wind, and that wind blew across the pool and literally, on, at, at points they'd have white caps on the pool and they'd have water on the deck from no one in the pool but just the wind blowing the water out. That's a huge. Oh, well, was enough heat loss in, in in this particular pool that the solar could not warm it. And um, the homeowners, it was a homeowners association, they refused to put a cover on the pool. So, you know, it's like 
you know, you want to drive and get the best gas mileage, but you also drive it 150 miles an hour, so you don't. Uh, you have to, you know, there's limits to um, what you can do. Uh, that's what, that's an extreme. There's the, the conditions, the environmental conditions are, are extreme and you may or may not uh, achieve the results that you hope to achieve. Um, on the pool, on the installation itself, generally sometimes uh, there's not enough collector area for the size of the pool. Uh, the panels uh, also may be facing the wrong way. Um, uh, pipe sizing, plumbing, you have to run plumbing to and from, maybe undersized. Um, we had one where the piping was buried in a, in a, in a garden, in a planters, and planters were always wet, so that moisture um, kind of wicked some of the heat away from the from the pool instead of going garden was warm but the pool wasn't so you know you have all these little things occur um, you know you have to be a uh, customer has to understand how the solar works should have an understanding of it um, if you have a pool company the pool service agent should understand the solar and make sure that he turns it back on when he leaves. A lot of them forget to do that. They turn it off for servicing and then they forget to turn it on. And then the homeowner calls the solar company and finds out that the pool service people turned it off. So that's a big call. You know, why is my pool cold now even though it's hot? So, I mean, it, most companies, most uh, manufacturers have installation guidelines and they also have you know help if you have questions on will it work i mean most systems that we get to after a problems are they're undersized they just weren't sized properly so that may have may have had to do with the amount of roof somebody wanted solar so they put three panels you can see there's seven or eight there you, you know two or three panels on a pool is you know if, if you understand the limits, it's like uh, buying a small um, Volt or Bolt, you know, the new EV car, and then you want to haul a trailer behind it, a fifth wheel with a, with all your toys. You can't do it. You need a bigger vehicle, just like with solar. You need needs to be sized properly for the pool. Exactly, just like any tool, it has to be sized properly. Right. Yeah. Uh, Another uh, thing that we'll get into is different types of collector that are used for pool heating. And again, using the right tool for the job, the same, you know, goes for the size of the tool and also the nature and what is the tool uh, to begin with. Uh, so, for instance, we have these two uh, examples here on this image. Uh, two really good examples of deploying different type of collector technology for different environments for pool heating. Uh, on the right side of the image, we have our unglazed copper panels, uh, the Oasis panels on a spa in Beverly Hills, providing extended pool season, extended spa season uh, for the pool. And then on the left side, we have our uh, glazed panel in Boulder, Colorado, on a recreation center that provides uh, pool heating and spa heating year around. So that's the big difference. Right. Extending the pool season or heating the pool year around. That's where the biggest difference in the type of the collector that we'll use will come into play. Because it's, uh, again, going back to how the laws of physics and nature works, if the environmental temperature go below a certain uh, degree and you're constantly losing temperature to the you're losing heat basically to the environment. There is no more heat to be collected and transferred to your pool. So that's when the glaze panel really right. come into play. Yeah. Either one, basically you're using a renewable energy, solar energy, you're reducing your carbon footprint. Uh, the property value as far as environmental friendliness and environmental consciousness of the building is concerned, and that's becoming more and more of a factor for buyers, for renters. People want to live in net zero houses. People want to live in 
uh, carbon-free uh, housing where they know they're not having a negative impact on the environment, or at least any negative impact possible was minimized as much as possible. And this is one of those great examples, you know, if you think about it, pool and swimming other than medical purposes is a luxury that we, you know, we afford ourselves and we add to our houses to enjoy. And it's a great thing that we're doing, but we can also be very responsible with this luxury and heat it with something that will pay for itself in a short period of time, relatively speaking, compared to the life expectancy of a pool and a house, you know, being 30 plus years, this system's usually paid for themselves in three to five years. And after that, you're enjoying a hot swimming pool almost for free minus the cost of maintenance, which is, our Bob will talk about that, but is usually very minimal. So once we take all that into account, we realize the added value to the entire property once this is added. And this was the conversation that we were having, the three types of collectors and Bob, I would appreciate if you could just like dig into that a little bit further between these types. Yeah, the, they're deployed. The collectors that are used primarily for swimming pools are unglazed polypropylene or plastic. They're the unglazed copper and then the glazed collector. Um, the differences are um, the unglazed collectors uh, work very well in uh, many climates. They're uh, relatively, they're the least cost of all three. Um, they're I think that's what you would see if you're looking around and if you don't see the other solar up there, you'll see a lot of black panels. That's the polypropylene. They work well. They're resistant to chemicals, to the pool chemistry. Unglazed copper is very good for the same. Heats the pool, does about the equal job as or equal as the polypropylene. Um, one advantage is it's fireproof. Um, so if you're in the fire areas, you don't have to worry about um, embers uh, falling on them, burning holes in the plastic. Uh, plastic doesn't start on fire, but it, it'll it melt with the hot embers. It lasts a long time. It's recyclable, 100% recyclable, the copper. Um, that was a, originally, that, that was a very popular panel, but copper is, cost again goes up. Uh, glazed collectors are, usually the unglazed collector in a box is what you the, essentially what it is. They're the most expensive. They're used with colder climates. If you want year-round heating, if that's the aesthetics you like to see on your roof, that's one reason people buy uh, will or will use the glazed collectors. Um, they involve a little more engineering um, to to install properly with a pool, but uh, some. And Bob, isn't a UV a factor? Or when we compare the call, you know, different type of uh, collectors, like what some of what areas do you see more UV affecting the panels? Like what areas copper would be more suitable for, and what areas polypropylene would be? Well, poly, the life expectancy of polypropylene in high UV, the desert is, mm -hmm. you know, uh, ten to twelve years. Uh, most panels have a warranty in that range, so beyond that, um, like with anything, your anything, your wood trim in your house or your car, <laughs> anything that's plastic, your kids' toys out there in the sun, they, they disintegrate. They're not as built. I mean, these panels are designed to handle that, but but well, ten to twelve years is a very long time yeah. for these panels. I mean, that's right. the last expected right. for me. As, uh, and compared to, you know, because we always, uh, it's always a trade-off, right? The, the copper panels cost more compared, but they are more UV resistant. But there's also yeah. other consideration that you have to take into account for the copper. And then there is the benefits of the poor coping, which is like lowering the initial cost of your right. investment considerably. And they still last a very, very long time. So uh, again, as Bob was saying, all three are great solutions depending on the application. It's always the application that decides. I believe the, what was the largest um, pool project that you were directly involved with, Bob? Well, it was actually a glazed 
a long, a long time, a glazed pool system in Long Beach for a swim swim center for the handicap. So it was all glazed. It was the indoor year-round pool, and that at the time it was put in um, that gas, natural gas was really high, and that literally kept them in business. And if from you know their expenses down, so they could still operate. Yeah, it was all um, donations, and it was. Um, that's what the pool was for, but that that system uh, worked for many years. It was uh, it's, it's been replaced since that. This is whew, 35 years ago. Huh. So yeah. that that just gives you guys an idea of the amount of experience that you know, we're dealing with here. But which is oh, for us, it's completely awesome because. Trust me, we don't even need to ask Google. We can always ask Bob, and he, <laughs> <laughs> he always has the answer for us. Uh, so, uh, Bob, we're going to get into a little bit of uh, you know just the preliminary general designs that are used for solar pool heating. You know, uh, first let's just uh, you know go over the direct approach. You know, you want to point out some of the, the yeah the direct system is there. You're pumping the pool water, as you can see in the diagram. You're the pool pump is pumping it through the filter, and if there was no solar, it would just go back in to the back to the pool unless there's a gas heater or some heater in there. But what we're doing is we're diverting, we're taking that water and diverting a portion of it, uh, depending on uh, what you need up through the panels, which is about three to four, maybe five gallons a minute uh, through each panel, diverting that water through the collectors and then running it back to the pool so it's heated. The differential, the temperature in and out is usually no more than 10 degrees. Uh, ideally, it's within three to six degrees uh, go from going up and down. Why? Because you're heating an awful lot of water. You have 10 to 30,000 gallons in that pool, but you're only raising it 15 degrees on, on average. So it's going from 70 to 85 maybe, or 75 to 90 if you like a warm pool. We're not trying to boil water. We're just trying to make it warm enough so you can stay and enjoy yourself. Um, all this, all, all of its, uh, the controllers are automatic. Um, all the piping is, you know, all the blue and red piping is sized. Uh, physical size is usually generally two inches. That's the minimum generally. Um, it's all sized. Uh, could be larger if there's a longer pipe run or more collectors, bigger systems have larger pipe. Um, and you want to, you know, maintain proper flow, not only, the key is not only through the panels, but your general pool cycle. Uh, you want to have a good turnover rate so you keep your pool clean. So you don't want to uh, inhibit the flow too much uh, that, so you have a, pool that doesn't get the turnover rate, so it filters properly. So that's that's all in the design. So maybe you have 60% uh, of the water going through the panels based on flow rate, and then the balance is just going directly back to the pool. There are devices that we have on here called the FlowBiz. A lot of customers, a lot of installers put those on where they would go where it says solar loop check valve on the right. They put that on there, and what that does, it allows the installer, its service tech, even a homeowner, to look at his system and say, oh, it's flowing properly, a visual flow meter that he can check his pool. So if he, you know, he can call, he calls his installer, he says his pool's not hot. He, the installer tells him to go check the flow viz, and it's not working, it, you know, there's no flow. And then he, the customer remembers the pool guy was there two days ago. He goes and finds out that he turned the solar off, so he turns it back on. Flowviz works; he's all good. So that thing is saved. This this little valve has saved service time for the installers who, you know, if you put a system in, you want to keep the customer happy. So you don't want to roll a truck at two hundred or two hundred fifty dollars just to go out there and flip the switch. Um, these the simple way to. You know, and then also for design, you can dial, you can adjust the flow rate through the collectors to match the design flow of the collector itself. Uh, the other sy system we have up there is an indirect drain back system. 
usually used uh, in this case for glazed collectors where we don't we, we do not want the pool chemistry to interact with the with the pool I mean with the panels they're usually copper or, or some material that's not resistant to pools um, it uses a closed loop system that consists of a heat exchanger the pump and the drain back tank so in this design you get the benefit of when the pool comes up to temperature or if it's shut down all the fluid in the collectors drains back drains into the drain back tank and the collectors are without water or fluid in them which uh, can either boil in, if in the summer and in, in very hot climates or freeze in the winter um, it, it covers both those conditions um, it's uh, it's used in certain areas to just keep everything separate the solar doesn't have any um, direct uh, very little direct impact on the pool itself the pool filtration system so there's ever a can always isolate it quickly and determine you know if it's the solar or the pool equipment that's having an, a problem we talked about the two possible different uh, you know configuration direct and indirect and we're just going to quickly talk about sizing the system again these are very very um, you know just rule of the thumb rough estimate uh, it might vary if you have a, you know unusual pool with unusual depth unusual location more than usual shading as Bob was mentioning if you have a high wind area that you will have really high surface heatscape all that must be taken into account but this is usually what we use at least for preliminary sizing of a system yeah 60 to 100 percent of the surface so if the pool you can see in the in the picture is 280 square feet and the solar is 280 square feet and it also looks like it's facing west so that's usually upsize the collector area if you're you're not in the general southern direction so if you're east or west and that makes a difference if you have low morning clouds if you're a coastal uh, so if you face it all east and it's all cloudy until the afternoon you've kind of missed it uh, literally um, Huntington Beach I used to work in morning clouds so if you had a southwest or western facing job it would work well in the summer where if it was east it would you know it would be wouldn't do so well and customers would always be grumbling you know we'd want a warmer pool I think you can tell what happened here I think the, by the looks of it these are older PV panels that were you know on the southern facing roof right so that was already occupied then they came in and added this and probably on this portion you get so much of the shading from this roof in the morning that it's not even worth having it there right but right again so, this was just like a really good example uh project done by um, one of our uh contractors in la area i'm not right. sure uh the name of the contract that's why i'm not mentioning i'm just uh use it as an example of how they size it in an actual uh building with an actual pool and it's a it's an interesting pool design as you can see it looks like a lab pool you know it's like right. narrow and long which resembles yeah. the shape of the array as well right it's right at the property line he's maximized his patio surface and and he's got just a few plants between <laughs> between the pool and the wall looks like all righty so uh there are incentives available uh for uh, these pool heating depends on the jurisdiction depends on where you're locating at, at uh, this is basically some examples that we had for uh, either rebates direct income tax uh, income tax credit loans low interest loans uh, for renewable energy installation sales tax exemption and property tax exemptions that uh, you might be able to take advantage of depending on the type of the system that you're installing and where you're located at and what rules and regulations apply locally uh, I know another factor that a lot of people take into consideration especially on commercial uh, properties those large rentals that have a pool that needs heating once you do that investment is considered a capital investment so depreciation also 
is another factor that you can't appreciate that property. Right. So again, all that benefits, but um, you basically, we're here to help. Standard is always here to help to put you in touch with the right local person who will know more than us about anything available in your area, what's going on in your state, your jurisdiction, your municipality, all that stuff. But there's also other resources that you can look into to kind of offset the cost of installing the systems. All right. There's also, you know, there's a few companies looking at uh, financing for nonprofits. Of course, a nonprofit or a, a no, like the YMCA or some buildings, they have community pool, schools have community pools that they're he, they're using a lot awful lot of natural gas, but they can't. Um, the investments that the outlay is not has to be um, you know budgeted and some of them can't um, afford that at the time so some companies are coming up with creative financing for you know properly engineered jobs where they're paying the offsets or that the, the nonprofit or the organization saving money on their fuel bill and they're paying less overall but then they're paying the uh, companies that are um, financing the job. So that, that's one possibility for large solar pool heating systems. That's a great point. And I mean, uh, if we know the future, at least in the state of California, we are moving at a very high speed towards complete electrification. They have different dates when or how we're going to arrive to that still up for debate, but the fact of the matter is that's the general direction that the state is taking. If that's a, usually, if that's the model that the rest will follow, if there is electrification and if you take out natural gas from this equation, then solar pool heating becomes even a more appealing option because it takes an awful, even with a very high efficiency heat pump, still takes an awful amount of energy to heat the pool. Yeah. He, uh using electricity. Yeah, you're using a, a heat pumps or kind of uh, pool heating that's being used more and more in certain areas. But, you know, it's electricity, you're using electricity to heat your pool. That's even though it's more efficient, it's um, still ex it can be expensive. So, uh, you know, solar is once it's in your energy is coming from the sun. There's no meter on it no utility attached to it so you can enjoy your pool and you know, don't have to worry about getting a bill at the end of the month that you have to finance. Um, this is, uh, you know, well, this is one thing that I, I like about uh, oh, uh, this slide is I like about solar thermal is how much you, you're getting for every dollar that you're spending on installation. You know, especially with these. If you look at, uh, I mean, I know right now because of everything that's going on because of the pandemic, people staying at home, or there's a huge demand for pool and pool heating equipment and all that stuff, which in turn has um, driven up the cost of all this equipment across the board. Doesn't matter if it uses uh, the conventional heaters, uh, solar heaters, all have seen a price increase. And the number that I have here is pretty old, but uh, just for the sake of argument, even if you adjust these numbers, you can always calculate how much you're gaining uh, energy by, by the, the amount of dollar that you spent. So this is a good example of a small system, relatively speaking, right. six, four by eight collectors. Four um, by 12. Four by 12, sorry, it says uh, OPP 48. And for the category for a warm climate, such as you know in LA, let's say for instance, for pool heating purposes, uh, if the, we assume the cost of installation is about five thousand dollar, you're getting about one hundred dollar per every dollar spent on on your pool heating equipment. And you have to keep in mind that once this dollar amount is done paying for its original investment for its initial investment. It, it's just the gain that you have for not having to spend that money on heating your pool. So that's all where your saving comes in. And based on that, and some of the numbers that was provided by the Department of Energy, um, 
we did some very rough calculation for a uh, order of magnitude ROI. And these numbers are based on what the Department of Energy has up and the cost that they're assuming for uh, electricity is, um, to my belief, is very low. The COP assumes for the heat pump is at 5.0 is quite high I'm still uh, to see in a, uh, you know, a, a heat pump in real life performing at a COP of five, but we assume all that is correct. Even if we take all that into account and consideration, $3,000 a year, if you want your pool at 82 degree in LA, $1,500 with a heat pump, if you want it at 82 degree. Yeah, but you can see the kilowatt hour price is eight cents. I don't know where, I mean, <laughs> not in LA or a lot of- I know, it's actually 85 cents, that's a typo, but it's oh. 85 cents, that's a typo, but still oh. 85 cents is pretty- well, 85 cents is, is, that's high for electricity or a kilowatt hour, yeah. if that's what you're paying, but, um, you know, that's 8.5. 8.5, yeah, that's-, that's Yeah, right. 85 a therm, yeah, no, no, it's- 80, 80, 88 cents per term is correct, and then eight nine cents a kilowatt hour is correct, right? Can't- that Very can't, low. That's, yeah, that's hard to find in California for sure. Hawaii, it's 45 cents. I mean, you have to keep in mind, this is Department of Energy, so they're right. using national numbers probably. Right. You yeah. know, so averaging it out. So yeah, so nine cents, even with that, still costing you right. $1,500. Right, back. it's still, and, 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 and heat, you know, heat pumps, they just, they take a long, they take a while to heat your pool. You're oh. not gonna jump in. Exactly, and you know, uh, it's, solar thermal we have that one week of ramp up and when, when once that's done then the pool is constantly at the temperature that you want it, which is usually you know full season starting you get it once and you're done with it even if those numbers hold correct you still see with the cost average cost of installation for a solar thermal pool heating system between five to seven thousand dollar you're still getting a, a return of investment in two to four years depending on your location, depending on te desired pool temperature, right. all that, the numbers I'm using here, of course, are based off the number we have. But that means after that period of time, you have a hot pool pretty much for free, minus the cost of maintenance. And Bob, could you uh, talk about the maintenance involved in solar pool heating? Well, on average, is it a high maintenance system? Is it a low maintenance system? How complicated? How often? What's going on with that? Pool, pool solar is generally very low maintenance. If you, I mean, it's somewhat re, um, tied to the maintenance of your pool. So if you keep a clean pool, your solar is part of that system and will have no issues. Um, you know, the, the most you can do with the solar on the roof is just wash them off if you want. You know, just get the dust off if you're in that kind of an area. So that's it. Um, every few years, have a service tech go on the roof and make sure everything's, you know, still secure. Just check it out. And, you know, people go 10 years, they don't even think about it. And then all this, you know. So very low maintenance for a solar for a solar pool heating system. Uh, some of the higher end, if the system is a higher end, like a glaze system, uh, there may be some uh, added maintenance involved, but that's usually, um, that's explained to you when you buy it. Um, but at they, the same time, I don't think those systems are often used on residential. No, settings. residential, there's very low maintenance. So as Bob was saying, you know, a glaze system is usually installed. For instance, we have a case study here at the Beaton College uh, Aesthetic Center, and they do have a glaze pool heating system because uh, it's in Beaton, Massachusetts. They need uh, pool heating around the year. Right. They need to keep the pool hot and ready to go for their athletes. But it's in a college, they have a maintenance crew, they have maintenance, mm -hmm. they have all that already in place. This will be just an addition to everything else that they're doing for that ginormous pool. For residential application is usually very, very oh, it's minimal. Yeah, look, I had a, uh, we, I had a phone call uh, earlier today that somebody was asking me that part of your solar manual for the system is telling me to, I have to wash my panels. Like, of course you have to wash your panels because to us, a clean panel means a high 
efficient, higher efficiency panel. But if you choose not to go on your roof and wash your collectors once a month, your system is still performing. Just you have to understand that once that thing is not clean enough for the sun to get to the collector system. Yeah, the performance, it's like your windshield, your windows, a skylight, uh, you know, if they're not washed off, period. if they get dirty, wash, rinse them off. Um, one thing I want to mention about the case studies that I have up here, uh, you will see that I have all of the case studies that I have are with glaze panel. And this is the reason why usually glaze panel are installed on a system that is more complicated and has monitoring. Right. Usually a residential unglazed pool heating system, even though we do way more of those uh, single family residential than this large commercial pools because they're you know fewer and far in between, but they have this sophisticated monitoring device that gives us the result and it gives us the performance of the system so we can actually see how the system performs. So that's why all of our case studies are based with the gla glaze panels, but there are the number of unglazed pool panels that go on pools are vastly higher than uh, glazed collectors. Uh, this is a uh, these two, uh, this is the Boulder, Colorado Recreation Center, which we pointed out earlier to in, in a conversation. And this is the pool and spa in Eugene, Oregon. If I'm not mistaken, it's a wellness center in Eugene, Oregon. Correct. So again, another one of the examples that uh, Bob had, and you can see with the indirect system, with the heated plate frame heat exchanger that they have here. And, uh, yeah. uh, with glaze collectors on the roof, they have an indirect system. They're providing heat year round because again, it's a medical facility, it's a rehabilitation, a physical rehabilitation center. So they have to be able to provide right. service to their uh, patients year round. So, right. And then the design, you see that the heat exchanger is quite large. It's yeah. also titanium. Why? Because the chemistry, and you've been in a spa, most of you have been in a spa one time or another, smelt them. Chemical concentration is a little higher than a pool. And you don't want uh, the heat exchange. You don't want that chemistry in the panels, and you don't want the heat exchanger to be affected by the chemistry. So these uh, flat, these are plate. They're called plate and frame heat exchangers, and they're the plates are all titanium, so they they work extremely well, and they are um, highly resistant to the pool chemistry. As, as long you know, as long as somebody doesn't drop a five gallons of acid or into the pool, they're okay. So if it's, you know, if it go, if the chemistry goes out a little bit or even a lot for a short period of time, the heat exchanger is very resistant to that. You won't have a problem. We have a lot of these type of heat exchangers for uh, commercial pools that use uh, glazed panels and they're very happy with them. And with, we have one, pool that's done on the East Coast, they have a heat exchanger that's about the size of your desk, almost the size of this desk. Um, they're all plastic panels, but the maintenance people wanted, they just wanted a closed system. So they have glycol in the plastic panels, the big heat exchanger is working just fine. So there's all kinds of designs that's again up to the installer, the contractor, design company, and you know, in the end, the customer. If the customer wants something and it's reasonable, then you know, investigate it and see if it is practical. Uh, at this point, I would like to kind of open the floor to any questions that you might have had uh, for either one of us, Bob, or I. And please, I right on ahead. For, we were talking about monitoring for uh, you know, pools and residential, obviously the, the homeowners monitoring is the temperature of the pool. So that's kind of why residential pools haven't been monitored to any great extent. It's the pool's either hot or it isn't. Um, again, flow meters, there, there have been always flow meters uh, available. Uh, they've been a little cumbersome. Uh, 
again, the, I mentioned the flow viz, which is this one here, has really made it simple for the homeowner to do a quick visual check of their system. Just it's like having the gas, your fuel gauge on your car. You know, it's, <laughs> it tells you it's, you're going to get home. Okay. And uh, Bob, I wanted to point out, I was reading the chat section from our presentation, and Corey and Dale both kindly pointed out that uh, Corey saying in the San Francisco Bay Area, current bill electric at 25 cents per kilowatt hour and gas at dollar 60 per term. Uh, and Dale uh, figured out that uh, average cost per kilowatt hour for electricity in the U.S. is 13 cents. So you can see that humongous difference between 13 cents per yeah. kilowatt hour yeah. and then 25 cents is double. So right. you know, everything you know changes. Yeah, things are depending going on the location. PG&E has to raise their rates to cover all their you know faux pas with the fires in the last few years. So you're just going to have increased in in all kinds of energy as as it becomes um, more valuable and um, you know more um, more practical for for all kinds of uses yeah great awesome so yeah please if you have any other questions, comment. Thank you so much for updating us with that information, Corey, Dale. Uh, I see Joe is uh, writing a question for us, so I look forward to that. Everybody else uh, joined us. I see some uh, people leaving. I know it's the lunch hour. It's time to get back to this for a lot of us in, in the West Coast, and then other people have stuff going on. Yeah. Oh, just oh, you're very welcome. Of course, our pleasure. And thank you so much for taking the time, joining us uh, for this full presentation, the Sun Perspective, Sun Earth, and we look forward to uh, be here again next month. You know, do our very best to uh, answer your questions, bring more information about solar thermal, water heating, solar thermal pool heating, and general applications of solar thermal to you. But we really appreciate that you all take the time and you know participate. Thank you. Of course. Uh, Randy, we'll make sure we'll uh, have these, uh, the recorded version uh, or the presentation out to you guys. All that will be available. Corey, thank you so much. We appreciate you. We appreciate the support. Uh, and we'll do our best to, you know, keep providing you guys all the information we can and all the support that we can in, with anything solar thermal. Very good. Thank you.